All right, hey everyone, this is Chris Keys for From Your Guitar. I'm hanging out in Nashville, Tennessee, and today I'm joined by Donna Diane of Juna, all the way from Chicago. Donna, how you doing? I'm doing great. How about this you? Is awesome. <laughs> I'm doing good, as well as we can expect it. I'm, I'm doing well, Thank, uh, thanks for asking. And uh, we should dive right into it, but it should be fair to mention, uh, actually I should ask our people to subscribe to our YouTube channel. But uh, to parlay that is that Donna also has a YouTube channel through her band, but also she does some stuff before the quarantine called, uh, the show is called Can I Touch Your Gear? And that's kind of where I got spun onto you guys. And then through that, I listened oh, to your band. Awesome. I was like, oh, this is, this is, I gotta, I gotta investigate. So uh, yeah, how did you come up with your show? Uh, with the names maybe explains itself, but. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, it's, I, a couple years ago, I had the idea for it. I just have so many good gear conversations with people. And it was something like, I, I just wish I could, you know, I'm always repeating gear conversations that I have. And I'm like, I wish I could show them to people. And then I was kind of thinking about, had the idea for the show, got um, Sarah Smolkowski, who does the camera work for it, involved. And, but like, I didn't really know who to interview. And then it kind of coalesced around um, people who build gear. Um, I, I love gear heads. I love learning from them and they're super funny people. So that's kind of how the show came together. <laughs> well, I think there's a good way to connect the dots here is that one of the people you interviewed for the show was Kurt Ballou and you're holding one of his fine instruments. So, this is and I know true. that he collaborated with you for the, for the music that you guys have created so far. So. Talk to me about that guitar because behind you is the one that I've seen you most with, which is that Cherry SG. Talk to yeah. me about the God City stuff. Yeah, so I just picked this up probably a couple of months ago. This is Kurt just started um, producing guitars through God City Instruments. That's his company. And um, he released like just like a small series one edition. So these are um, these guitars. It's a mahogany body. This one has a wenge top on it. Um, it's actually a chambered body, so it has a lot of really pretty, nice sustain on it. Um, bridge pickup only, obviously my favorite. <laughs> I don't need neck pickups <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, humbucker, really cool pickup. I'm actually really enjoying this guitar. I usually go in for single coils. I love P90s. But um, this one's just kind of um, been like making me like go a little like moodier. I used to do like more like blues infected, infected, inflected solo stuff. So um, this kind of like got me started playing that kind of stuff again. And it's just like it's it's a really pretty guitar and it, it does it gets loud really well. It has a lot of really nice sustain on it. Um, I can just play like a little bit. playing this bass synth while I'm demoing the guitar, but you can kind of get, it, that's one of the things I like about it is it cuts really nice. Like it, it doesn't get lost. Some of the darker, like moodier guitars I've played just tend to get lost when everything comes blasting in. So I'm really digging this one. This is a, it's a good pickup. And he actually just, I think the other day closed the pre-order for the series two. I think that one's, to pick up, that might just be solid body. Now I'm blanking on the specs, but <laughs> go go check his website. I'm plugging it for him to see if there's yeah. you can still get one because they're very cool guitars. <laughs> well, the the first time I got turned on to Kurt's like a fascination beyond being a producer and a you know a big part of Converge is he was passing out business cards at Nam where those like circuit boards or the little circuit boards you could create or connect with the turrets. 
Yes, that was another thing he like, because when I interviewed him for Can I Touch Your Gear, he talked about the Brutalist Junior, which is that PCB business card. Yeah. And he actually was like, you should build one now that it's covid and nobody's going anywhere so actually i have it on my board now it's the first pedal i've ever built so that was cool <laughs> how was that experience was there a learning curve or was it pretty straightforward you know i soldered like a little bit in high school actually like was kind of into um doing that kind of stuff in high school like i wanted to learn to build and i just kind of let it go so i was like a little nervous about my soldering skills it's, it's not like pretty in there but it's good enough that it, it worked on the first try so um it was actually it was easier than i thought it, it would be so i definitely encourage anybody who's thinking about doing it like all of kurt's pcbs are like a good place to start with a it, good stepping so. stone yeah well, before we move on to your SG and maybe hear that a little bit, is do you know what pickups in there, the humbucker, or is it something that Kurt's like maybe designed with an OEM, kind of like another pickup company? Um, the, I don't think there's like a specific company for it. I, or, I know he's calling it like a slug jammer or something because the the giant slugs in this, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna have to like double check with him about it. Who okay. actually produced them? Gotcha. And uh, uh, yeah, it would be great to actually maybe hear the SG and maybe compare the two real quick. Yeah. All right. So this is my, this is a 67 SG Junior. Um, I am in love with this P90. It, it runs super hot. Um, obviously, this is all mahogany and just good old classic SG sound. Um, <laughs> Like, I haven't even changed my amp, but you can tell it just, like, drives the amp a lot hard, harder. And, um, we'll play some uh, you expect Man, from an SG. <laughs> yeah. Now, where did you get this guitar? Because I've seen this even with your previous band. You, you had this, right? Yes. Yeah, I've had this for a few years. I picked it up at uh, Rock and Roll Vintage in Chicago, and it was just like, it was priced really well. And it's obviously like player gray. There's been a lot of modifications to it. Like somebody installed this switch that does nothing and like <laughs> <laughs> but it made it cheaper for me so yeah I, I'm always gonna love this guitar it plays super well it still sounds so great for its age and you know it can take a beating and still be good so <laughs> well and what strings do you run on your guitar or guitars just tens the Dario any tens, specific brand the yeah. Dario yeah the Dario's yeah, how, I, how do you pronounce, what is the official way to pronounce it? I've heard it so many different ways. Diodario. Um, yeah, I think that is, or we could step into a bigger mud pile and <laughs> try to say piezo or piezo. That, <laughs> that's, 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 uh, that's another mouse trap. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'm, you know, it was funny and about this, uh, the craft, the GCI Craftsman guitar was funny because that came, you know, I had bought it you know, I've ne I'd never played it before and I get it. And I'm like, why am I have so having so much trouble bending these strings? And then I was asking Kurt about it and he was like, I was like, what gauge strings do you play with? Because this is such a, like a man guitar. Like I could not bend anything, but they were like just really heavy. I think he had like 11s on there and that just felt massive to me. So <laughs> I swapped those out. Have you ever bought any other instruments like that, unseen, unplayed? Like you're just waiting for it to get in the, you know, from the internet? Or no, the I get nervous about it. I don't know. Because yeah. I, I mean, I like, the, I mean, this is the first like new guitar I've bought in many, many, many years. I mean, usually I'm, I'm always picking up used stuff and then I get kind of nervous about it. I know I shouldn't be, but like sometimes buying used online, like 
vintage, you never know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think we've been like ignoring the elephant in the room or the, ignoring <laughs> the elephant at your feet is the fact that you're playing two instruments. And this so we should true. address this. We should address this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is a, in case you haven't noticed, this is a foot control bass synthesizer. Um, it's actually split up into two components. On the right is a Moog Minotaur, which is like the brains of the operation. And then this Roland PK-5 I have is just purely um, a, like a MIDI controller for the synthesizer. So same as like a keyboard that you would hook up. And the idea behind it is it's supposed to be like kind of similar to a Moog Taurus, which a lot of people have heard of. But those yeah, why are, don't you go with that one? Why do you not use that? Um, because they're super expensive. <laughs> I like yeah. to do things the cheap way. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the Minotaur I've heard is like similar to the like synthesis engine that drives the Taurus three, um, which is based on the original Taurus one. So um, and that's like definitely the most sought after of them. Um, it's programmable so you can pre-program your bass sounds and I've just like done, made like a few modifications to it to make it function more like a Taurus and something that you can really, um, use on the fly totally live instead of like pre-programming the actual sounds. Like that's my whole thing is everything has to be done live. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it's in, whereas like a Taurus three, if you buy that, I mean, they don't produce them anymore. So you have to like buy it used. You're going to spend at least two grand, 2,500 on it. Whereas like a lot of people have been putting like pairing the Minotaur and the PK five together. Cause you can combine, get those, get everything for less than a grand. So it's definitely a way more affordable alternative now i have someone that's never played with any of these types of <laughs> devices whether it's the roland pk or or the ob obvious uh father of that would be the 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 taurus and the moog family is are you creating notes or like chords with your feet or or what are you actually producing with your feet so the minotaur is a monophonic uh synthesizer so it's, it's only capable of producing one sound at a time which is good because when i step on two pedals <laughs> like it doesn't sound like it, it doesn't reveal as many of my mistakes <laughs> yeah but um yeah it's only um one note at a time but i do have the way i've um programmed the filters on it is it does do like um an octave up on it it blends an octave up tone on it to make it sound a little more full but yeah it is only one at a time i've been thinking about getting a polyphonic synthesizer to do b bass chords essentially on but I, don't yeah. know, I haven't got delved that far into it yet People are like, yeah, it's too proggy. So I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's cool because you can do, I mean, you can definitely dial. I was like pre-programming like some of the core sounds. Like this is like kind of like the default Taurus 3 sound. Like you can definitely recognize <laughs> that sort of thing. But I mean, like my... The tone that I've kind of like dialed in for myself that I use on most of my songs is just kind of like a modified version of like the Taurus 3 sound that's... Oh. So it, it maintains like the same growl, but the filters like not as pronounced on it. So you're not hearing it like, like that really revolvey type thing. So yeah, they're super versatile. I mean, you can like go really crazy with the sounds, but I tend to use it like I've been doing as really just like a separate instrument, like the equivalent of what an electric bass would do rather than, you know, and a lot of people use it for more like atmospheric type stuff or just something to add like a little more oomph to like a bass, a standard bass sound. So yeah, I know that Getty, obviously Getty, the people people come in mind are Getty Lee and Troy Sanders from Macedon that use it in the way that you're saying they kind of add a little, little oomph to it right and it's totally it's awesome for that i mean like this is like this is the low e that would be on a normal bass and like a detuned bass to like a low c would be this so i mean this definitely i mean you can just this 
sustain that like low sound like way longer than you could on like a regular bass. So I'm all for that. <laughs> now I got to ask an obvious question is, or maybe not obvious question, but a question that comes to my mind while you're doing this is it seems like there's a lot of footwork that you could be replaced with the bass player. Yes. <laughs> so uh, avoiding any of the cliche bass jokes or bass player jokes, why not? Cause like a song like bless your money, you're double duty in it with your feet tapping and then your hand, you're playing a, you know, a fairly complex guitar part where you're both your hands and feet are moving simultaneously in a way that I can't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can barely walk, let alone doing what you're doing to play. So I guess to shorten up my question is why not have a bass player? Um, so this like, well, the short answer to that is because bass players have a lot of opinions. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, how it sort of evolved was sort of in my pre the band I had before Juno, which was called Be Drawn Jewel. Um, it was kind of like getting to the point where I was knowing that like the breakup was imminent, like people had other projects that they were interested in. And so bass played a very prominent role in that band. And I wanted a way that I could continue playing solo, um, but not sacrificing the bass. Because like a lot of people, you know, when they do that, they'll have solutions like split their signal between two different amplifiers or add an octave pedal. But I, I like so much bass guitar, like counterpoint and kind of like mining that for po possibility. Sometimes they move and sing, sometimes they kind of like fight with each other. And I just really loved that idea. So I started putting this whole rig together and I, I played solo a couple times and it went over well and people were like, what are you doing? So then I was like, okay, let me get a drummer and like just try to do this as just sort of an experiment or a stunt. And then it, it just, it's so fun at shows. I'm so mad we can't play live now because it's a Juno show is really funny because people who don't know what's going on are kind of standing there like, where's the bass coming from? And then people kind of walk up to the stage and then they see, and then you can see it on their face when the realization kicks in and then they go like whisper to other people. So <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> so I'm just, it's like this crazy experiment that I'm just going to like take it for as, as far as it'll go, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> And it is cool for like songwriting too. Like that's another big component of it. Like it is cool having both instruments at the same time with voice that I can kind of on the fly, like kind of modify the different parts. So it's just, it's kind of more efficient in a way rather than like pre-recording something and then tracking over it or like, you know, all the other standard methods people do. <laughs> yeah. And not to put you in the spot, Donna, but it, could you show us a little bit of pl Bless Your Money? Just because of oh, sure. how, because we have, we have a camera set up above you. Yeah. That people have been enjoying sure, already up to this point. So they can see you do both playing guitar and uh, with your foot, your feet. Taste of it. <laughs> it's 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 boggling how you're able to do that, and then on top of it, obviously you're standing, and then you're taking in people in the crowd, being aware of what's happening on stage. So you're you're multi-talented. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's this weird thing that like sometimes I'm I'm like a person who's like in my head a lot and tends to like overthink things a little. So this is actually like good therapy for me because like when you kind of overload the system with so many tasks at once. Like you just have to like let go and just kind of like float above your body <laughs> and yeah. let it happen, you know? So I'm just, it's, it's actually like a really, like a, an unexpected joy, like doing this live. It's, it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's funny how many times we will go do rig rundowns and someone will have a massive board or multiple boards 
and they refuse to use a switcher to, with a similar thought process with you is that it enables them to perform better and freer knowing that they have to be dialed into the performance to hit the pedals they need to rather than having a rack or even a switcher like a looper they rather just kick all the pedals on that they need to yeah it's i know it's like people ask me all the time that it's like this is, seems needlessly complicated but like i it just, I just take like a perverse enjoyment to things that are <laughs> <laughs> needlessly complicated you know because it's like it's done all these things like i've had to like essentially like invent pedals to like do different jobs so i've like kind of um like we were talking about the first pedal i built it helped me like learn how to build build this um uh, sustain switcher that basically like toggles the sustain on the bass so i can do that on the fly you know so i just I don't know. I'm just somebody who's like more fascinated by like learning how things work than just like doing the easy way or something. <laughs> I don't know if that's <laughs> smart or dumb, but <laughs> it's working for you. <laughs> now, moving on to the amps that are sitting to your right is, and it might be what's in the water in Chicago, but your abrasive tone reminds me a lot of like touch and go music from the 90s. Oh my God, yes. That's what I, I grew I'm up sure on. Some so. of, yeah, I'm sure some of that's the sun and the trainer, but tell me what's going on and, and how you're concocting your tone there. So guitar is being routed through the trainer. This is a 40 watt custom reverb, um, 12 AX7s, EL34s. Um, it's just, I can't say enough about trainers. I also have like a combo. I, they've been very reliable for me and just like as like a vintage tube amp that ages well like i'm stoked on it because again you can still get them for super cheap that i mean you can pick up a head for like 500 still that's probably bad for me as somebody who owns multiple ones that they don't appreciate in value but <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's i that's a big recommendation for me i love um like this is it it's dialed in at like a two right now <laughs> And it's already breaking up. Um, it just, it's a really nice foundation for pedals. And actually, so I usually route it through this um, Emperor 212. This has, um, I loaded Eminence Wizards in it. But I'm actually not playing through it right now. This is, the head is going through a load box direct ah. to my computer. Uh, it's a um, Torpedo Captor by two notes. This was another Kurt Ballou thing that he turned me on to. Cause I was, when we were starting the whole, the whole COVID thing, I was like, Oh, I should ask him like how to like make like an ISO booth or something in my house to like for my cabs. And he's like, no, like buy a load box and run it direct to your computer. I'm like, what? Like, how could you say that? And then he like showed me like the two notes, like speaker modeling software. And it's, I'm, it sounds great. Like, I'm actually really impressed with it. He has, like, a lot of studio stuff that I'm, like, just as a layperson, think that that sounds, like, kind of, like, sketch or, like, yeah. <laughs> inauthentic or something. And then it sounds amazing. Like, he's so good at it. So now I trust him on things like that. So, yeah, that's how that's running. And the beta is um, what the Moog is running through. When I first put that together, I ran it through just so many amplifiers and it just did not sound good through tube amps to me. So obviously the beta is solid state is hundred Watts. Um, it just like, it really accentuates like the growl to it. It just like gives it like a little extra texture. So that I have like a 115 that I usually play out of, but back here I have the matching, uh, 215, to Ooh. the 212 somebody was selling um matching um well it was a giant bass rig originally that was like bi amped and then i just split up the cabs and turned one into a guitar cab so sometimes i pull out the big bass cab. people love the 215 i mean they just like they people just love big cabs <laughs> yeah i mean that thing as i say for a 15 inch speaker i was gonna actually actually ask you if it was a 412 and uh, i was oh no know, here, i'll move out of the way so you can see 
Oh yeah. Scott the Geos. Well, actually, I interviewed um, somebody from Emperor for the Can I Touch Your Gear series, and he was kind of explain because these are early Emperors, and he was kind of explaining to me how the base cab design has evolved, which is fascinating because like base cabs are always a lot more difficult to build than guitar mm-hmm. cabs and design. So I learned a lot about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, is this uh, assuming you, you're going to go play a gig in Chicago or go on tour, would this be the setup you would use this, the, the trainer and the sun and the two cabs? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I would just see, I have an emperor like 115 that I had built okay. just for touring. We like, fig- Oh, it's so sad. Like right before COVID we like figured out how to like, fit all of our gear into like a Subaru Outback <laughs> wow. and, like tour with it. And we were, it was so efficient and so streamlined and then like everything got canceled. So I was like, ah, but yeah, usually the 115. And if I'm, if I'm feeling feisty, I'll bring the 215 with for a show. <laughs> <laughs> I do like standing in front of it while playing, like getting like, Hitting the butt with some bass. <laughs> I was gonna say that's like the ultimate. You know, people always say I like to have air moving on stage. I'm sure those two fifteens get. Oh yeah, my hair is like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, John, would you take us through your pedal board now? Yeah. So um, some of the modifications that I've made to it to make it work kind of more like a Taurus is there's no um, like native octave switching on it. So you're pay- you're basically stuck between like low C and high C, but I um, pre-programmed some of these switches at the top to like take me up an octave so I can kind of like do it on the fly. Like when you like run out of real estate. just kind of like allows me to easily like just toggle up and down without like stopping mid song or something. So that's something anybody can do. Um, just reading the manual, the Roland PK five manual, and then figure out how to do that. Um, let's see what else with it. Um, the advantage to using, this is going to get really technical for anybody who's interested in like assembling one of these, but like the, I recommend getting the PK-5A because that one you can also transpose on it. So instead of just going up by octaves, you can also like, you know, go up a fifth or down a fifth to shift the keyboard so that you're avoiding like constantly toggling octaves if you're like right on the cusp of them. So that's another one. And then like some of the custom pedals I had made, I uh, mentioned this like switcher that I built. Um that cuts the sustain. That's just basically um, a passive expression pedal. Like uh, the the ones you're supposed to use with the Minotaur are like the, you know, like rocker pedals, like same as you would modify any like or modulate any like guitar effect with. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was kind of using that to just like toggle on and off the sustain. But like when, so when I play, I'm standing on stage normally (laughs) and I'm like (laughs) basically like just stomping everywhere with my foot. So I broke so many passive expression pedals. Like it was just like I have a graveyard of them and it was just getting way too expensive. So I was like, somebody has to build like an on off switch. And I found nobody does, but I found one company who like made something similar, but it did not work with the Minotaur. So I, figured out I had to teach myself how a foot switch <laughs> works, but I figured and how to wire the resistor so that it would ta- it would um, just basically switch on and off that one filter on the Minotaur. But I need to make a website to like tell people how to do this so they can build their own or I'll build yeah. them one for them <laughs> if they want. <laughs> You have not been stagnant these last six or seven months. You have been, no. you know, trying, you've been trying stuff. <laughs> I've been trying not to like mourn the loss of live music by distracting myself. But, um, oh, I should also mention too, I have this other pedal that is way beyond my ability to build. Um, it was 
I needed something that was going to toggle my guitar and bass effects loops at the same time. And it, so it's like similar to like, you know, an effects looper that anybody might have to like toggle on multiple effects at the same time without mm-hmm. having to hit all the buttons individually. But nobody made one for two completely separate signal paths in the same pedal because most people aren't playing two instruments <laughs> at once. <laughs> So um, the one I have is just basically um, a guy by that does bright onion pedals was like the guy that my friend found to um, finally build this. And it basically, the switch on the left is the guitar distortion. And then the, on the right is the bass distortion. And then the one in the middle just killed like kind of a kill switch that just kills them both at the same time so then i always have options like in the middle of a song if it's like okay only guitar distortion is supposed to kick in right now or only bass distortion or i need them both at the same time because yeah like i have so many switches i'm working with i have to like minimize the amount of button pushes i have to do (laughs) yeah anything that can help yeah (laughs) So I, I just like, I have fun. I kind of like geek out on like, have like inventing new stuff or like even just like developing like technique on it. Like it's really funny, like standing on one foot for a set and like playing. I've had to like sort of like develop my own technique for it. Like I was like looking at how church organists play with their feet and then kind of like modifying that. I had a, like a trainer at my gym, like help me find the optimal, like functional positioning <laughs> for it. <laughs> so I, I just love that kind of stuff. Cause it's like, you know, with guitar, it's, you know, you're not going to be like guitar has been done. Like all the technique has been like basically developed for it. And then every now and again, somebody will like do something that I'm like, what? I've never seen that before. But like yeah. generally like it's, you're not like, there's no new territory to like pioneer with it. So I, I don't know. I like geek out over stuff where it's like, Oh, like nobody's been ever been insane enough to do this. Like, let me do it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, you it keeps your wheels turning and then yes. I'm sure you uncover new things as you unintendedly do so. Yes. <laughs> now before, as we dive into that, your actual pedal board, that's I'm sure designed to go with your guitar. Do your effects actually run? Do the pedals themselves, get played through the, the, the synthesizer or no? No, so everything, the synthesizer signal, I have it like on the board with everything. It's all in a mess. You'd never know the signal path <laughs> from the way it's arranged. <laughs> but basically the output of the Minotaur goes into the input of the this like effects loop pedal, just like the my guitar signal goes into it. And then from there, it's routed through my bass distortion pedal and then back to the looper out to the amplifier. Gotcha. Okay. And then same thing with guitar, just normal signal path. <laughs> what What is the, the bass distortion that is uh, running with the the synthesizer. Oh, so that one, this is a cool pedal. This is the Ad Violence pedal from Jupiter FX. They're a German. Oh, wow. That's a great name. That's pedal a great company. Name. Yeah, it's JPTR FX is how it's spelled if you want to look it up. Um, yeah, he makes like a lot of cool pedals. And actually, originally, I um, had been using a old Fender Blender for my bass distortion, the octave fuzz on this. I thought worked really nicely with the Moog, just kind of like adding more like grit and texture to it. Cause that's, that's the main thing that like an analog synth is missing to me is like, it, it maybe like sounds a little too round or like a little too pure. So it's just finding ways to give it texture. So that was working good, but I was getting a lot of loss when I would click it on of the actual like low end frequencies mm. from it. So this pedal was like a great alternative because here's the normal sound and then I mean you can hear how it like really like just like scoops out the middle and it just sort of, you really have that low end but you still can have that nice like grit on the on the upper end of it. So yeah, that 
became my go-to distortion. It's there's a lot of possibilities with that pedal. This is a um, diode switch that makes it like just a little less aggressive. But obviously, you want it to be more aggressive because yeah. what's the point of Especially less aggressive? <laughs> yeah, it's not called less aggression. It's called was it again for the people keeping track at home? It's called add, add violence. So add violence. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's some like hidden um, like uh, pots inside that you can, um, I, don't know, I don't know if they're technically pots, I don't, but basically you can like turn them to d dial up an octave fuzz effect. There's actually like, I think it was like 16 dBs of extra bass boost you can get on it. So like very versatile pedal, definitely like it for the Moog. <laughs> Would you say it's kind of like a uh, a clon in the sense that it's it uh, you you keep it on all the time or or do you turn it off? Um, no. Usually it's like half and half. I kind of do the same with guitar. Like I'll just kind of you know, depending on, because it, it it can be kind of a lot. So I like to you know really save it for like the big moments. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's probably like 50-50. Well, probably like 75 distortion, 25 clean. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, Donna. Now, uh, walk us through your rest of your uh, guitar pedals. I know that we had briefly touched on the, the, the pedal you built from Kurt. Uh, what else? Oh, is yeah. That yeah, this is like, currently this is the Kurt show on my board. So I'll get my other <laughs> guitar out. Um, oof. Um... My kind of go-to distortion is actually like a prototype pedal that he built that we used during recording. So we recorded our, for people who don't know, we recorded our first album with him um, back, I don't even know when it was, like a little over a year ago. And he had just like a bunch of pedals that he built like in the studio, a bunch of stuff that we were playing around with. And this, um, Bad Larry pedal ended up being the one that we used on uh, most tracks. And it's just kind of like a... Just like a straight up nasty distortion type uh, pedal. And um, yeah, I tend to be like like a lot of... Something that's like a little little more abrasive for like my bass distortion. But it actually, it like cleans up pretty well um, to like just tightening it up for like. So like, you can just do like standard rock stuff like that. It gets super messy too. Oh, and there's also an um, an octave fuzz on it, so like for like it's like a little different for like beat stuff. Um, so like the normal one is, and then the octave fuzz is just kind of like crushes it a little bit. To kick that on for like that part you know just give it a, like a little extra bite but yeah that's kind of just become my go-to distortion pedal so this one's no. called the batter larry because it has the octave fuzz the bad larry doesn't the batter larry does <laughs> now is that something i'm sure that you mentioned that you use it a bunch on the, the record is uh like nurse and nun there's some pretty gnarly parts in that and obviously throughout the rest of the record too but yeah, yeah. There was there was a couple different things. I I think we used like a witch finder on some of it. I'm trying, I, it was kind of recording was kind of a blur. It was like I did not sleep and it was just <laughs> because I was like doing, you know, Nick Smolkowski is the drummer. So he had all his tracks done in a day and then I have to do all of the other instruments in the band. <laughs> so it was just no sleep for like <laughs> a couple days. But it was so much fun. On, on a sidebar, do you record, or when you recorded with Kurt, do you play both the instruments at the same time, or are you tracking 
the the base stuff separately no, and then making sure we did it separately i actually wanted to i was like oh just to save time i can do both at the same time and he was like no <laughs> cuz yeah i mean to be to be perfectly honest like when you're doing the two instruments at once your timing's not going to be i mean any i think they always say with multitasking anything that you do you're going to do like a slightly worse job if you're <laughs> doing multiple things at once so um yeah like you have to kind of take that into account that it's gonna dial back your doing both at the same time is gonna dial back your ac accuracy um you know 10 percent or so <laughs> <laughs> well that's the charm of like doing it live is that that's part of the environment you know a little more a little less accurate a little more raw a little more energetic exactly and that is part of the fun it's like it keeps shows super interesting like nick my drummer in Judah, like he saves my ass so many times. Like he really, he's just locked in. And so I can kind of just be like slipping and sliding all over the place. We, it was really funny. We actually, um, got to open for converge at like a house of bands show. And that was definitely the biggest stage we had played and his kick drum. I mean, the way, they were, you know, amplifying it. It was the whole stage was just shaking. And so like my pedal boards like vibrating away from me during the set and I'm like contorting myself into all these positions. But it was like it was the most fun ever because it, it's just like it just feels like you're just going 150 miles an hour and like you don't know like what's going to happen, but you're just drive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> see if it comes off the rails. But yeah, it's, it's, it ends up being a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we've covered the batter, Larry. What, what else do you have down there? Um, so, okay, so this is the Brutalist Junior. This is the one I built. Um, just like a, a little darker. So it's got a lot of character. It's cool. I actually like, I've been kind of digging, switching them both on and getting the like nasty feedback. <laughs> it makes having a silent setup at home that's directly routed kind of fun because I can still get like crazy feedback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty gnarly. <laughs> So yeah, that was that was like another thing I picked up in the studio because like kind of before we recorded with Kurt, like I didn't really go in <laughs> contrary to appearances. I didn't really go in for like a lot of different pedals. Usually I'm just kind of like a one distortion or fuzz that I like or, you know, kind of thing. Like I don't really go in for a ton of effects. But just like watching Kurt like play around with pedals in the studio and hooking them up in different combinations, like he was able to like get sounds out of them that I was, you know, kind of made me less of a pedal skeptic. Like, you know, because always when I record, I kind of like, I don't like not being in the room with my, I, well, I should say, I like being in the room with my amplifier. It feels weird to me to be like separated from it and like not feeling it and everything, like not getting like the natural feedback. And I think when we were at God City, that was like the first time like I felt really comfortable not being in the room with the amplifier and kind of like letting Kurt like dial in sounds and like working it out and getting something that like a tone that I was happy with. So that like now I'm more of a pedal person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, we, before we did this, you sent me a, a kind of a preview of how you're going to have your camera set up. And so I got to peek at your pedal board and I'm curious how you use uh, the Earthquaker devices tone job because it's kind of like an EQ boost pedal, right? Yeah, that's just kind of like a, I guess, clean boost type thing. I think I had it on when I was doing my SG, but like, I just, I kind of been using it with um, the this Craftsman to just kind of like, give it a little bit of boost so it's at the amps, like at the same breakup point as with the SG oh. sort of a thing. But yeah, 
usually like I don't use it that much to like aggressively shape the tone. It'd be I just like sometimes if like you're in a room where like the highs are like a little too much, I might use it. But it's more of just like a clean boost, fail safe type thing. <laughs> gotcha. An equalizer in in the sense yeah. that it brings yeah. the two guitars to the same plane. I guess, I guess you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not in the general sense of like an EQ pedal, but in the sense that it brings both your guitars to the same playing field. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Perfectly set. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else is down there lurking at your feet that is ready to make destructive noises? Um, that's kind of it. I have another, I have a uh, Moog delay pedal on my board. Is that something you use much uh, like in a I live setting? It's there to just kind of like play around with it, but it like, it's, I think it's not even like plugged in right now. Um, like I have it there to just kind of like experiment with, but yeah, like I, I still haven't been like going like the very like experimental atmospheric type route. So it's there for if I do decide to go there, but I don't know. I'm still having fun just like doing the straight up rock thing. So <laughs> Yeah, there, there's no like space travel that happens in, at least in the first record, Juno. There's no, not, yeah. not, yeah, not really. Cause I think like that's, when people first heard about like me putting this whole thing together, I think that's what people expected, especially like being solo, that it would just be like me, like kind of like yelling or ranting over like, no, like atmospheric noise or something, which would be cool too, but like, I don't know. My heart is like definitely in like songwriting and like, you know, like doing, doing like melodies and boring stuff like that. <laughs> so, I'm just going to keep doing that, doing loud melodic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you should. One thing I got to ask before you go, and it's relating to the song Kiddo, is the end of the song. I want to say it's probably the synthesizer, but it doesn't sound like how you have it running most of the record. Is, is that what's happening or, or yeah. is it uh, so, your guitar? So that that was based on a, oh, and I can't do it because of the, I, I was through the Fender Blender. Um, oh, okay. That was based on like a really, let me see if I can like dial that up. Like the basic noise. That was like a high oh. part, yeah. Like just, I would kind of do like live, just do this like crazy solo with my feet, like just kind of like mashing the pedals. And so I was trying to like do that in the studio. And then we ended up just like layering a bunch of different like noise synth solos on top of each other. So it, it came out as it's like totally a unique own thing. <laughs> it's a it's a blender of itself. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was interesting. <laughs> well, typically we do this when I, uh, the front of the video, but I forgot is what tunings are you using for, for Juno? Um, I just honestly just use standard tuning. I know like a lot of people after playing for many years, get bored with it and do something different. But I always say instead of, um, changing the tuning, I just like started playing a different instrument at the same time. <laughs> Same time, that's how I dealt with the boredom. <laughs> well, Donna, I appreciate you hanging out and doing this. I know that you uh, get, went through great lengths to kind of get the video set up for us to make this work, especially with the overhead cam, so I appreciate it. Oh, this is so much fun. I'm so excited to do this. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, and maybe next time we'll check in, you will truly be uh, a solo show. Maybe you'll have a kick drum that you'll be playing with your feet. Yeah. Too. I don't know. <laughs> I gotta do the the real one man band, <laughs> one woman band. <laughs> you get some like cymbals and you can tie the cymbals to your knees and you'll be good <laughs> yeah. to go. I'll start busking. <laughs> <laughs> well, Donna, let's hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah. Uh, as we do love you with a, a two piece having a drummer, that's that's a lot more powerful. But anyways, thank you for your time and I really appreciate it and uh, all the best. Oh, well, I had so much fun talking to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, everyone out there stay safe and thanks for watching Premier Guitar Rig Rundown.